Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mihaela. As Mateo said, I'm a research engineer at DeepMind and a PhD student at UCL. And today I'm very excited to talk to you about GANs. Oops. Okay, so the first question to ask is why would we still care about GANs? That's a pretty reasonable question. Given that these days diffusion models are producing really great results and VAEs are also catching up in terms of image generation performance. And I'd like to give, to give a twofold answer to this question. First, GANs still produce great results on image generation. And secondly, and this is what we will focus on in this talk, they provide an excellent testing ground to learn about a few things which are important for machine learning, including distributional learning principles beyond maximum likelihood, which are all very familiar with, and about optimization in games, specifically about two-player games. So this is what we will talk about today. First, we will talk about GANs in a very inf informal, intuitive way, and then we will start with GANs from a distributional divergence point of view, and then talk about GANs as from the perspective of optimization in two-player games. So first, a disclaimer. This is a very large field. If you look at the number of citations of the GAN paper, I'm pretty sure that we're over 30,000 by now. And there are many, many GAN works out there, including many models that will be not covered here. This doesn't mean that these models are not important or interesting, and that doesn't mean that you don't have to learn about them. But this talk specifically takes one view, which is the view that I've reached out by thinking about this for a while, and it focuses on general principle rather than specific models. So specifically, if you look at the slide, you will not, at the slide, you will not see a lot of very popular, very, very useful models. Still, please learn about them, but they are not, not covered here. And please look at references and related works at the end of the slide. Okay, so without further ado, let's start talking about GANs. So the main motivating reason to start thinking about GANs is the main progress that I have made in image generation from 2014 to 2019. So if we start with the original GAN paper in 2014, we see that they were able to generate what was for that time quite great results, black and white images of faces, very cropped, very centered, but still relatively low resolution. And just in the span of five years, GANs went from those type of images to very high resolution, high fidelity images of faces as shown on the bottom right hand side, but also more multi-model um, image generation, such as data generation on models trained on ImageNet, which are able to generate dogs, cats, volcanoes, pizza, and more. So this is what motivates us to think about GANs, but how do GANs do this? Well, they learn an implicit generative model through a two-player game. And what we will do for the rest of this talk is try to unpack this sentence. So first, what do we mean by an implicit generative model? In this case, we mean a model, a latent variable model that is able to generate data, but we cannot query for likelihood. So one way to think about this type of models is that they are simulator. They're a simulators. They're able to generate samples from the, from the distribution that they learn, um, but we will not be able to ask how likely is it that another data point can be generated by this distribution. And the way the models do this is that they sample first from a prior that we choose. This is often going to be a lower dimensional Gaussian distribution, so for very high dimensional images, the size of Z here is probably going to be something like 124, 28, sorry. Then we sample from uh, this, the, this Gaussian prior, and we do a four pass through what is often a deterministic neural network, and we obtain a sample. So this is what is different for this implicit latent variable models compared to the other type of models that you might be familiar with. We don't get out a likelihood. We don't even get out a conditional likelihood. That is, in the output, we don't have something like the pro conditional probability of seeing this sample given Z, our sample from the prior. We just have a sample. So the question that comes next is, is what objective can we choose to train such a model? What type of loss function can we use in order to learn the parameters of this feedforward generator or our convolutional generator to train uh, our model? So first, we're in the generative modeling business, so we do have samples 
from the data distribution that we will have to feed into the loss because we have to ensure that the model is learning a distribution that's as close to the data distribution as possible. Now, in terms of asking how can we learn this model, the first answer that comes to mind is, well, we're trying to learn a generative model and we know how to do maximum likelihood. So can we do maximum likelihood in this case? And the answer here is no. If we look at maximum likelihood, which is minimizing the KL divergence between the true data distribution P star and the model distribution Q, Q theta, and we do a little bit of manipulation, we see that this is equivalent to minimizing this expectation here at the bottom of the slide, which is the expectation under the data distribution and the log likelihood of the data under the model. So here we see a challenge because, as I've stressed before, we don't have access to Q theta of x. So we will not be able to use this approach to train our model. And instead, we will be looking for a different type of objectives that depend on the data and the model distribution only through samples. So once we have um, objectives that depend only on samples, we can approximate them in an unbiased way with using Monte Carlo estimation. We've already seen that for maximum likelihood and the model because we always have only samples from the data distribution. Um, and that is not a problem because in maximum likelihood, you depend on the data distribution in expectation. So every time you see something like this, you're going to approximate it using samples from that distribution. And the only thing that we will do in latent variable models is that we will look for similar types of objectives for the model. So we're going to depend on the data distribution in expectation, and we're also going to depend on the model distribution in expectation. And one thing that is specific to implicit data and variable models is that we can often rewrite the expectation under the model distribution using a change of variable formula. So because we know that we obtain samples Q theta of X from, um, from an implicit latent variable model, we can then apply the change of variable formula and, writing, and write it as follows, where you have an expected value under the prior Q of Z and then evaluating the function that we want to compute the expectation for at samples obtained from the model. And the advantage of this here is that then we can easily, easily use this to, uh, tr to find parameters theta using backprop. So now we've talked about a problem of having a model that we don't know how to train, right? And the idea behind GANS is, okay, we don't know how to train this one, let's introduce another model. Now you might say, Michal, I already have a model that I don't know how to train. You're about to introduce another model and we still don't know how to train that one. Well, luckily for us, training the second model is going to be a little bit more easier. So the idea behind GANs is to introduce what is called a discriminator. So the generator here, I'm going to always denote its parameters as theta and the discriminators as phi. And we're going to make this discriminator be part of the loss function for the generator. So this is new. This is not something that we often do, let's say, in supervised learning. You have our model, and your loss is fixed. You use cross-entropy, and that's it. Here, the loss will change with this other model. And now we think back about the fact that we want to train a generative model. So in part of this loss function, which now is going to be trained, has to come the data as well. So we have to put the data set in somehow. And one natural way to try to answer this question, how do we train this new model, is to make it answer, what is the difference between real and generated data? That's quite intuitive. It's like a teacher, right? It tells our generator, well, this doesn't look too great. How about you do a little bit better? So that's the main idea behind GANs. And what we're going to talk about today is how to quantify this real versus generated question in a distribution sense. But what they did in the original GAN is make this very clear connection to something that we know how to do, which is to train classifiers. How can you answer what is real versus what is generated? Well, if I asked you how do you answer what, the question of what's a cat and what's a dog, you would immediately say, well, I take a classifier, I train it with a binary cross-entropy loss, and I learn how to distinguish between cats and dogs. We can do exactly the same here but with samples from the data and samples from the model. So we're going to train a classifier to associate label one with data, with real data, 
and label zero would generate the data. So if we formalize this, again, we're just going to use the binary cross entropy loss that we're familiar with. And we're going to say that the discriminator D with parameters phi has to make sure that assigns uh, that it classifies real data as real. So it maximizes the log probability of that assignment and that uh, generated data is generated. So it associates label zero with that. Now, the nice thing about this is that we have satisfied some of our requirements. If you look at this formula, it looks exactly like I said, we need to look out for, which is a sum of two expectations. So we're not in trouble here like we were with maximum likelihood because we know how to sample from the data and we know how to sample from the model. And the goal of the discriminator here will be to maximize its prediction accuracy. So that is very simple. You just train a classifier. We all know how to do that. Now, the question is, once you have this, how do you train the generator? So we need to now look back at one part of our graph, which is the generator model and think, how are we going to train that one? And an intuitive way is to say, I want the generator to fool this discriminator. That is, whatever the discriminator is maximizing, the disc generator should minimize. Why does that make sense? Well, if you have a good teacher that is able to distinguish between real and generated data, and you're doing really, really well, that means that you're, as a generator, that means that you're very close to generating the real data distribution. So let's look a little bit at a, at a scheme of intuitively how this would go. So you start with a really bad generator. It just generates random noise. That's what happens when you do a forward pass through a newly initialized neural network. And this is our real data. So then the discriminator will learn to distinguish between real and generated data using its classification loss. Then what happens on the orange arrows is that the generator has to improve. And one thing that it can do is to generate something that looks like a dog, but perhaps it can be a little bit blurry. Why? Well, because the discriminator didn't have to focus really on sharp edges or anything like that in the first stage, because it had to distinguish between this and this. So it was super easy. It was like, okay, if it looks like something, then it's real data because the, the regenerated data looks like nothing. So the first step for the generator is to generate something that's kind of like a dog, but it doesn't have to be too good. But then the discriminator now has to improve because otherwise it loses the game. So the discriminator, for example, now in this simple case can focus on edges and then it can generate better data. So this is the idea behind the game between the two that ends up with a situation where the generator can generate really good data. So now to summarize a little bit, we have a discriminator that maximizes a loss, the binary cross entropy, well, the negative of the binary cross entropy loss, and the generator minimizes the same loss. So now if we wanted to train such a model, we would just apply what is called alternative gradient descent. So in theory, what we actually want is to train the discriminator to optimality each time. So every time you want to update your generator, you want to do <laughs> gradient descent to convergent for the discriminator. But ain't nobody got time for that. So what we're going to do instead is we're just going to update the discriminator a few times, and then we're going to update the generator. So this is the main idea behind GANs, as, at least as how they were introduced in the original paper. Um, and now, hopefully, if you were tasked to implement a GAN on MNIST or something like that, you will know what to do. You have two networks. You implement the binary cross entropy loss for one, minus that for the other one, and then you train them together using alternative gradient descent. Now we can focus on the generative model side of things. So far, I have provided, sorry, there's a question. Yes. Thanks for the interesting uh, uh, talk so far. Uh, I was wondering if you show the dog picture all the time, it, it will get really good at uh, generating dogs, but can you mix it up with, with other pictures or do you have to put them in sequence or how do you make it general? Yeah, this is a very good question and I'm gonna show some examples of how this can go wrong. But in general, you just sample uniformly. So this is the nice thing about expectations. So the 
uh, objectives for the binary cross entropy is expected value under the data plus expected value under the model. So that means when you feed data to the discriminator, you have to get an unbiased sample from the data. So you randomly sample from the data set and you feed that in. It doesn't, and it shouldn't be actually only dogs because then you end up into some sort of cycle thing that I'm going to show later on. But you always sample unbiasedly from the model. It's easy. You just do, if you want n samples, you do n forward passes so with different inputs. You sample from your Gaussian, you do a forward pass, you get a sample. You sample from a Gaussian, you do a forward pass and then you get another sample. Sometimes, I'm not talking about this today, but sometimes you want models to be conditional. So here I'm just saying, give me a sample. But for example, if you are in an application where you want to generate a dog, you can say, give me a dog, which is a conditional generation, but this is not something that we're talking about today, but that's a very good question. Other questions? Okay, so, so far, I didn't talk at all about why this is a proper generative model. So what do we mean by that? Often when we train generative models, and we've seen this a bit with maximum likelihood, you minimize a divergence or a distance between two distributions. And that's great because it provides us with some guarantee. So divergences between two distributions are always positive, and if it's zero, the two distributions are the same. So this makes for a very nice loss function because if it goes down and then you reach zero, you know you're done. And for the game that I've shown you so far, it's certainly very intuitive, but we don't know whether we have some guarantees that Q theta is gonna be P star. And actually what they show in the original paper is that if the discriminator D is optimal, okay, this is a big if, but if that is true, the generator is minimizing the Jensen-Shannon divergence between the true and the generated distributions. So that means we do have some connections to learning a distribution with this game. Under a big asterisk, the model can learn the data distribution. And of course, things are even a bit more complicated because this argument doesn't talk about the capacity of neural networks, which we're going to use, of course. So it's more about a general argument about, is this related to learning a generative model? And the answer is, it is. Now, We've talked about Gantt from this intuitive perspective of the game. We have an implicit latent variable model. We don't know how to train it. What are we going to do? And now I'm going to show you how to create your own GAN. So we're going to start with the divergence this time, and we're going to go all the way up to the GAN, and then we're going to go to another type of losses, and then we're going to go all the way up to the GAN. So what are F divergences? F divergences are a class of divergences that include the KL, reverse KL, Jensen, Shannon, and more. And one question that you might ask is, why should I care about all of these divergences? And the answer is because they matter. So if we look at the following example, which I find very illustrative, imagine that I have a multimodal Gaussian, such as a Gaussian with two modes. So there's data here and there's data here. And my model, is a Gaussian. So we know that the model is not gonna be able to fit the data because the model is unimodal, like we see here, and the data is bimodal. Now, the kind of fit that you get really depends on the type of loss that you get, that you use. So for example, if we use the maximum likelihood KL, like I'm showing there on the left, what the maximum likelihood KL does, it tries to explain the entire data. So how can you explain data here and data here with a Gaussian, well, you can put a fit all over. Of course, the problem is that if you ask this model, if there's data here, it's gonna say, yeah, good job, but there isn't. Now, if you use the reverse scale, and careful, the scale is not symmetric, this is really important, it's gonna do something else. It's just gonna focus on this mode, let's say, or this, depending on where you initialize. And then the good thing is, is that if you generate samples from this model, they are only gonna be samples from the data distribution, but it's, if you ask it if there's data here, it's going to say, nope, never seen anything here. So this is, neither is great, but this is a practical issue that we often face. And which one you want depends on the kind of application that you have in mind. If, let's say, you're an artist and you just want to generate really cool, let's say, pictures that look like Van Gogh or something like that, you might want this one. And say, okay, I forget about parts of the data for... Let's say some of his paintings were about still life. I don't care so much about still life. I care more about the portraits. 
Of course, that's up to the model to decide which one it will look at, but you might care about sample quality the most, and then you can look at uh, the scale. Or you might want to make sure that you can always answer the question, is there data here with yes? If there was some data there, then you want the other scale. So this matters. And F divergences are a family of divergences defined as follows. So now we have to choose a function F, which is convex, semi-continuous, and F of one equals zero. And once we have that choice, we can define a divergence that satisfies the conditions that I mentioned earlier. So it's positive always. And if it's zero, then the two distributions are the same. So this is um, nice in the sense that we have an expected value under the model, which is good, but we depend on the density ratio there, which is a bit problematic. But we're going to see some ways to solve that. The nice thing is that for certain apps, we recover the divergences that we care about, KL, reverse KL, and so on. So now to, back to the problem. We have this F applied to the density ratio between the two distributions. Well, we don't know P star of X because we're in the generative model business, so we only have samples from P star of X. And we don't know Q theta of X because we're trying to learn an implicit generative model, so not, not so great there either. So what can we do? Well, we can use the fact that F is convex. So if we look at the definition of the convex conjugate, we have the following. F of X is the supremum of T of Tx minus F dagger of T. So we define F dagger as the convex conjugate of F. Now, if we just replace this in the definition of the F divergence and do some manipulation, which is just arithmetic, I'm not going to go through it now, but you can have a look at it later, you end up with the following. So an F divergence can be written as the supremum over all functions from the domain that we're interested in, let's say image domain to R, and then a difference of two expectations, but here we have F dagger. F dagger is not a problem because we know how to compute it. F is usually a relatively simple function like U log U and so on. But, and we have a difference of two expectations, which is great. Now the challenge is that we replace something that we don't know with something that's kind of intractable. Because to take a supremum over all functions of uh, relatively complicated functions that depends on two distributions is not something that we can do. What we can do is try to restrict ourselves to a smaller family of functions. Let's say neural networks. Then we lose something, we lose the equality. We can no longer say that the F divergence is equal to something, but we have a bound and we can connect this bound with the F divergence. Now there's even there a little bit of a problem because even the supremum over all neural networks is not something that we can compute. We can't analytically find out what the weight values need to be for a network to maximize this function. But we can do optimization. Next best thing, optimize the loss function to maximize this with respect to parameters phi. So now the good news is that we have something that is kind of familiar. We have a discriminator. We have a model that we train to distinguish between samples of the two distribution. The first is an expectation under the data. The second one is under the model, and they need to be as separated as possible. So this starts looking like a GAN a little bit. So now in our picture of GANs, we know how to train our discriminator. Great. We ask ourselves again, how do we train the generator? Well, we're going to minimize whatever the generator is maximizing. And here we can also think that whatever the generator is maximizing is close to a divergence. So again, we're back to this idea that we're trying to minimize a divergence. So now we know how to train the generator. We have the opposite loss of this, and then we're just going to do back prop. Now there is a bit of a challenge here, um, and that we're minimizing a lower bound. That gives us no guarantees about what happens to the actual divergence. So if there's a line and the line under it, and I bring the line under it down, I don't know anything about what happens to the thing at the top. There is no mathematical guarantee there. And this is different. I just want to contrast to VAEs, and you're going to hear more about them later, where you minimize an upper bound. If the upper bound goes down, I know that the KL, the true KL, cannot be higher than that bound. So there is a bit of a challenge here, but it tends to work rather well in practice, primarily because the goal of the discriminator is to make the bound tight, is to be as close as possible to the F divergence. So between this cat and mouse game, between 
raise the bound, lower the bound, you end up with something that works really well. So, so far, we have seen this recipe of you start with an f-divergence, uncompute it, we use a variational bound, now you have a supremum, then you approximate that divergence using optimization, and then you minimize that approximation using a generative model, so you have your f-GAN. So that's one way to create GANs, and there are many GANs that start this way. You can get to the original GAN by starting this way. But there are other ways to create GANs, starting from IPMs, Integral Probability Metrics. Now, a little bit that's quite important is that IPMs are distances, they're not divergences, which means that they are divergences with some extra criteria, which is that they're symmetric. So we've already seen that the KL is not symmetric, and they satisfy the triangle inequality. And we can look at IPMs defined this way. So now we depend on a family of functions f, not a function f. So things are a little bit different here in the sense of to define an IPM, you have to choose a family of functions f, and you have to take a supremum over that family of functions. This starts looking quite familiar by now. And a difference in expectations. Well, already when we see difference in expectations, we know we're good because we know how to approximate this thing using Monte Carlo estimation. Now, again, I just want to stress that you get different IPMs by choosing different family of functions f and not little f. And not every family of function gives you a distance. So let's give a simple example. If the family of function f is f of x equals 0, so just the one function, is this a distance? Well, it can't be a distance be because no matter the distributions, the first expectation is going to be zero, then the second expectation is going to be zero. So the distance is going to be zero always. And remember what we said, if something is zero, then the two distributions are the same. So we can't just choose any function family, but there are some that we know that satisfy these constraints that I mentioned before. One is the set of one Lipschitz functions, when we're going to talk about in a bit. But we're going to see the same recipe that we've seen with FGANs. We're going to see it with IPMs. So let's look at the Wasserstein distance. Here, we have just replaced the function family f with the family of one Lipschitz functions. And one Lipschitz functions are what I like to call slightly well-behaved functions, which means that the absolute value of the difference in function output can't change more than the absolute value of the difference in the input. So if I change my function, my input a little bit, the function can't change too much. So let's look a little bit as, as an example of why this is important. So imagine we have samples from our two distributions here, B star, Q theta, and we're trying to find the best F that maximizes the difference between these two expectations. We're trying to find the best F because that's the definition. We have a supremum over that difference in expectations. Now, one way to do that is, of course, to make sure that f is positive around the data and negative around the model. But if you look at the f star that's being computed here, it is relatively smooth. You could technically, if you don't have the Lipschitzness constraint, go from minus infinity to infinity, and then you don't have anything meaningful. The fact that this line here doesn't change much more than it does here, it's because of that one Lipschitz constraint that if I change my input a little bit, the function output can't change too much. Now, we are in very familiar territory, and the reason I bring this up is specifically because it is similar, and we can see some patterns that often come up in machine learning and then use them again and again. So we have a supremum over one Lipschitz functions. Again, we don't know how to compute that. There's, this is a very big family of functions. We don't know how to compute that exactly, we're going to use a bound over neural networks. So we're going to, instead of looking at the whole family of one Lipschitz functions, we're going to use a neural network to approximate that bound. And of course, that's going to be our discriminator. So now we have another way to train GANs, implicit latent variable models in an adversarial way. You approximate the Wasserstein distance, and then you use your uh, generator to minimize that approximation just like we've seen with f-divergences, but now we started with an IPM. 
Still minimizing a lower bound, I just want to stress that this is different than some of the other things that we might be familiar with, but again, it still works very well in practice. And you can do this for other IPMs if you're familiar with kernels. Um, you can choose the family of functions to be an RKHS. Same issue, you end up with an MMD GAN. Um, and that's, that's it. Any questions so far? Because I'm just going to go a little bit more over this, but if there are any questions. A small summary. Uh, so the, the introduction of other side distance brought some advantage. It's not very clear in my mind what it is. Um, is the question why would you use a Wasserstein distance as opposed to a divergence? Yes. Yeah, that, that is a very good question. And actually, so I, maybe I can answer that in a few slides because that might, that might help. But to, just to summarize, different divergences and distances have different properties, right? Just like we've seen that. And the Wasserstein distance tends to work very well when the two distributions don't have overlapping support. Um, which I'm going to show an example of in a bit, and I can highlight that. And this is why it was introduced originally, actually. That's a very good question. We have another question here? Yep. Hi, thanks. So I have a question <clears throat> for the discriminator. Does that take place within the actual GAN itself? <clears throat> Excuse me. Or is it like a VAE where you have the latent distributions and then you have the KL divergence within there? Because I'm seeing that you do the discrimination between the actual data distribution and the generated. So is that output from the GAN, the data distribution, or is that within the GAN? Um, not fully sure I understand the question. So, so the, the discriminator, uh, where is the picture here? So it takes a while to, yeah. So what the discriminator gets is just samples from the data and samples from the model. And it's just a classifier. So from that perspective, the only thing that the discriminator needs is a forward pass through the generator. Now, the thing that gets a little bit more complicated is that when you train the generator, you have to backprop through all the way through the discriminator to get, get gradients. And this is a bit like, is it like a VAE? I'll have to think about that, but uh, no, no. So this, this, is, this is different because you have to backprop through D to get the gradients for G. And that is because the way you think about the discriminator, the way I like to think about it is as a learned loss function. So it's just part of the loss, and in this case, we just train our loss. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that answers it. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. My question is, uh, the depicted loss solves the uh, posterior collapse issue that affects uh, a lot of uh, GAN architectures? Uh, posterior collapse, do you mean, posterior collapse is more like a VAE issue, mode collapse is a GAN issue. Um, I'm going to get to mode collapse in a bit. Um, the main message of this talk is actually that the best way to save mode collapse is through optimization. And a lot of these distributional divergences and distances are great, but you don't get around the fact easily that this is an adversarial game and you have challenges optimizing adversarial games. I'm going to get to that a bit later. Thank you. Okay. So just to recap a little bit this part, you have an implicit model. You want to make it minimize a distributional divergence or distance, but you can't. For the KL, you can't because we don't have likelihoods. And for the other things, it's intractable or hard to optimize. So we approximate that using a learned discriminator. That's the main message. If you want to think about GANs in one slide, I would say this is it. Now, one question, and this is again also a bit of a summary of what we've discussed, but I think it's important, is why would you train a GAN instead of directly doing divergence minimization? So one answer is sometimes you just can't. If you have an implicit model, like we have here, our latent variable model, we've already seen that you can't directly minimize the KL divergence. That is not possible. You don't know what, P, uh, what Q theta of X is. But what you can do is start with the KL, apply a bound, and then get an FGAN. So that works. 
It's not the same. I just want to stress this again. It's not the same as minimizing the KL because when you do max of phi with respect to some parameters of a neural network, you have no guarantee that that is going to be optimal, that that optimization procedure is going to be optimal and that your discriminator has the right capacity. Another uh, thing is that you might want to say, well, I want to minimize the Wasserstein direct, um, distance directly, but you can't because it's intractable. Again, this is something that the Wasserstein distance is interesting, but you can't directly minimize it because you can't compute that supremum. So what you can do is approximate it again with a neural network and then minimize the, uh, that. Now I think it goes back a little bit to the question asked earlier also about the Wasserstein distance Sometimes one of the reasons you want to do GANs is because the KL and the Jensen Shannon have a kind of like notorious problem, which is that if the two distributions don't have overlapping support, they provide you no learning signal. So what do I mean by that? Imagine my data distribution is here and my model is there. They have some bounded support and they don't have, there's no space where they both put mass. Now the KL is gonna be infinity here because here we're gonna have a ratio between P of X and Q theta of X. It's gonna be infinity. So that means that if I want to move my model a little bit closer to the data, I actually can't because there's no signal coming from my loss. The KL divergence cannot distinguish between the two distributions on the left, on, the, on your left because they're both equally bad. But if we look at it, actually the one closer to the data distribution seems a little bit better, right? So this is a bit of a problem, and the Wasserstein distance doesn't have this issue. So this is why some people prefer it. But the good thing is that GANs don't have this problem. And the reason they don't have this problem is because they're not exact. So they don't optimize the KL divergence exactly. So this is an example from, a, sorry, from an older paper. And we see here that if we initialize the GANs distributions to be uh, without overlapping support, the GAN still learns the two distributions, at, uh, the data distribution at the end. So why is that? Well, the reason is that NLPs can't model jumping from zero to infinity, right? So if we look at how we started with FGANs, we started with a true ratio that we can't compute, and then we ended up with a bound, and we approximate that ratio using, let's say, a neural network. Now, NLPs tend to be kind of smooth. So if we look at our previous example, the NLP approximation is not gonna jump from zero to infinity like the density ratio would, but it just like smoothly goes up. So if you move your model distribution closer to the data, the discriminator, in this case, this NLP is gonna say, yeah, good job, you're in the right direction. The last point, is that you can think of discriminators as learned distances. Distances is in quotes here because, of course, we've seen to be a distance, you have to satisfy certain constraints, and the discriminator with the neural network does not. But if you think about discriminators as part of this learned loss function, they do give you the chance to put some information into the loss, not only into the model. So we know that well, at least we used to know before transformers that if you have image data, you better use a component for your model. Why not do that to the loss as well? And this is what the discriminator does. You can make a convolutional discriminator and then your loss knows that it should focus on edges rather than if you use an NLP, which will not know that. So the way I sometimes think about this is that the, the, the discriminator or the teacher learns the distance between the data and the model that then can be used to train this model in a useful way. Okay, so now I have, oh, just in time, a bit time for questions and a bit of a breathing time. I'm aware that one hour 20 is a bit long to listen to me talk. So you can just breathe for a minute or ask questions or come to me or whatever you prefer, just for like a minute or two. Yep. And is there any relationship between um, using SGD instead of Adam? Because SGD goes faster 
to convex solution or it's uh, something else? Well, I, I love your questions. You're anticipating the second part of the talk where it's gonna talk only about optimization. SGD versus Adam and Gantz, it's a long debate. Adam seems to work very well, but in a different way than we are often used to in supervised learning. So for example, with Gantz, if you add Adam to work really well, you should use low momentum. So low momentum, like beta one or things like that. There are a few tricks to get them to work. But in general, I would say that most very successful GANs still use Adam. Um, <clears throat> I have a question regarding like the smoothness of the learned function or the new neural network that you are learning here. Um, it seems that like because you actually have some smoothness and then you are assuming convexity on like the at some point, I think you mentioned like that you're actually assuming convexity for approximation of the lower bounds. Um, so the question is like, does that limit the kind of distributions that you are actually trying to learn? Uh, because that actually kind of limits uh, Lipschitz continuity in, like you are actually just assuming like that the, your function is gonna be Lipschitz continuous. So I wonder if, does, if that limits the kind of distributions that you can learn regard like, oh, yeah, pretty much that. <laughs> Okay, this is a good question, and I, I just want to come back. The assumption of convexity is on the little function f, which you can just choose and has nothing to do with the discriminator. So we don't assume that the discriminator or the generator or any learned function is convex, or we don't regularize for things to be convex. It's more like once I choose an f convex such that semi-continuous and f of one equals zero, that means that I have an f divergence, and that is fixed in that training. Like I choose for the KL is like u log u. That's fixed, it's a very simple function. But then to your second question about smoothness, that, that's a good question. Um, in theory, so for example, for the Wasserstein distance, you need to assume one Lipschitzness, uh, and you know that you can learn, uh, like in theory, in the absolute capacity situation, you will be able to learn any two distributions. In practice, we actually tend to use smoothness constraints even though when they're not required. So for example, there is a paper, very influential in the GAN community called Spectra Normalized GAN, where the discriminator was made to be one Lipschitz even in the original GAN, for example. And that works very well. And I think the reason is this. You tend to get a lot better signal from smoother functions. Um, but actually what the field went with this afterwards is that they also made the generator one Lipschitz and they kind of, this seems to really help, but I think it often helps from an optimization perspective. And we really have to be careful with GANs and this is why I want to talk about optimization because a lot of times we like to justify things from a distributional learning point of view, but actually it just helps optimize this really hard to optimize models. And I think this is a lot where the one Lipschitzness comes in or spectral norm comes in. Yep. Sorry, I have two questions. First, about like the lower bound that uh, we present for the distance. So if we use uh, don't scan for a time like duality so we can get different lower bound. Uh, I don't know, I have, have like people explored using that uh, lower bound for GANs and uh, how that could compare? People have explored all kind of lower bounds. Uh, and again, my personal opinion currently is that it's all about optimization in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, how easy is it to optimize these um, in practice? But uh, yeah, people have, people have explored various kinds of GANs uh, and with various kind of bounds. But mm -hmm. I think that the, the biggest challenge with the bound actually is that you can't report a number, right? So with VAEs, you know that your KL is under the thing that you report, but here you, there's nothing to report because there's no mathematical relationship between them. Yeah, uh, also I have another question about uh, Wasserstein distance. Actually, Wasserstein distance, we can compute that for discrete uh, distribution, yeah. but for continuous distribution, usually we approximate. Yeah. So when we use it for GAN, how much we approximate, how we consider that approximation? So when we use it for GANs, we just use it as we say. There are many other ways. I, I mean, the, the whole Wasserstein distance uh, with discrete or with reducing it through like random projections to smaller um, um, like smaller data um, is a very active area of research and has been tried. 
but to my knowledge all of these things tend to be more expensive in practice to use so i mean there, there are many that like the, there's a whole optimal transport literature out there right there are many ways to do a lot of these things but there's often just as we will see with optimization the trade-off between like mathematical elegance and what's computable in practice but um, if you want, I can send you some papers that have looked into these different directions. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you for the, the great talk so far. Um, in your mathematics, you introduced this notion of a convex conjugate that seemed to be very important. I was just wondering if you could explain maybe a little bit about the intuition about what this concept is and uh, uh, why it's important in the mathematics. Well, it's um, it's just due to the fact that convex functions are like this, right? So you can just always look at the tangent and kind of like bound them that way. That's why it's their TX there because it's a line. Um, so there's a connection in the duality between these two two functions. In this case, I would say, I mean, in this case, the intuition is more about, um, and this is something that I think is imp important, is about going to, from something that is intractable, because we have f of something that we can't do, through something that is optimizable. And that's the main thing, that every time you think, well, actually, I don't know how to compute this, the key thing here is that x is only for tx, and this you can compute at t. So then you, you have the supremum, but every time you see a supremum, uh, in mathematics, supremums are super common. They appear all the time. But in, when you think about it in the context of machine learning, you can think, OK, I can approximate this using an optimization. So that's, that's the way I think about it in this case. Okay, so I think I will get going with the second part of the talk, which is going to be about optimization. So, so far, we talked about Gantz as having these two players. One is the discriminator who tries to answer the real versus generated question using all this kind of the distributional learning that we are talking about. But what do you do in practice, right? You have this min-max game that I talked about, the fact that Technically, you should optimize the discriminator to optimality every time you update your generator, which is expensive. But um, what's interesting here is that even though fully optimizing D is not tractable, we can think more about what the kind of dynamics that this type of game introduces and how we can try to solve them. So just to uh, recap a bit from the first part of the talk, the simplest way to implement this in practice is to update the discriminator a few times. Sometimes even one is enough. So you update the discriminator one time and then update the generator. One, two, three, not much more than that. Um, so that's kind of the practical implementation. The type of update that you use depend on, depends on your optimizer. But so far, we haven't really talked about gradients. Uh, and we talked a lot about loss functions, but turns out that gradients really, really matter, especially because we are training neural networks. So let's think about the original GAN. We talked about the GAN as this two-player game where you have a classification loss, right? You, the discriminator classifies this real data as real and generated data as fake, and the generator is trying to fool the discriminator. And we even saw that it has a connection with the Jensen-Shannon divergence. Turns out, in practice, this is very hard to get to work. And the main reason for that is to do with gradients. So for this loss for the generator, when it's doing poorly, is getting very little learning signal. That means that if D is able to immediately tell, oh, this real data is, the, the generated data is clearly fake, then it's getting very little signal to train. The gradient is close to zero. So what does this mean for us? It means that if you remember this kind of picture that I've shown you earlier on the discriminator improving, then the generator improving and so on, it breaks that chain because early on the discriminator can easily distinguish between random data and uh, real data 
but then the generator won't be able to improve because <laughs> it's getting very, very little learning signal, close to zero. But what they already noticed from the original GAN was that there is another function that we can use that solves this issue. And word-wise, this is going to be a bit of a mouthful, but mathematically, it's quite simple. So the original law says, I don't want the generator to classify generated data as fake. I don't want that. That's the loss for the generator. Now, this law says I want the discriminator to classify generated data as real. So there's the difference between not fake and real. That's, that's it. And once you make that mathematically, then when you're doing poorly early on, when the generator is doing poorly, it's getting a lot of signal to improve. Uh, and this is actually one of the, it's called the non-saturating loss. This is one of the losses that was used for a very long time and it's still very popular. So this brings us to this idea that optimization is important in the GAN context, but also we are now for the first time, this is the first GAN I'm showing you, that is not zero sum. So more generally, you don't have to assume that GANs are zero sum. We can say that the discriminator is minimizing function LF, the generator is minimizing function LG. Of course, we recovered a zero sum setting if LF is minus LG. But we still have a bit of an adversarial structure. And this goes also a little bit to the mode collapse and mode hopping uh, question earlier. Um, what are some of the challenges uh, with optimization in adversarial games, zero sum or not? Imagine I have a data set that is only cats and dogs. And the generator has gotten to a situation where it only generates dogs. Maybe you saw that dogs are a little bit easier than cats, they tend to be, and it just got into that situation. Again, remember that when we're talking about optimization, we can no longer assume optimality at all. So it just happened to got into the situation. Okay, we assume that. Now, a simple solution for D here, for the discriminator, is to say, okay, cats are real and dogs are fake. This is not perfect, but it's getting everything right 75% of the time because it's getting all cats right, because the generator doesn't generate dogs. So 50% is right. And then um, it's getting 50% of the dogs right by saying that they are generated. It's just getting wrong the real dogs, which is 25% of the data, assuming equal data split. This is again, not perfect, but a pretty good solution maybe for a neural network that doesn't have enough capacity, hasn't been trained enough, who knows. Now, this is where the fun starts. One thing for the generator to do here is to say, well, I'm going to generate only cats. Because if I do that, I'm going to do very well, because the discriminator thinks that cats are real. And then one thing for the discriminator to do is to catch up and say that cats are fake and dogs are real. So now we are in the situation where we are looping between generating either only cats and only dogs. Of course, this is a simplification. This doesn't mean that one arrow is one update, but this can happen and it actually has a name. It's called mode hopping. So that means that the generator is hopping between modes of the data. And actually, if you stop the training at one point, at some point you have to stop training, you will have either a generator that only generates dogs or one that only generates cats, and that's called mode collapse. So this is an example here from a GAN I trained a while back where it should generate a lot of faces, but it generates the same two, three faces again and again. And GANs have been known to suffer from mode collapse. And actually this comes hand in hand a bit with hyperparameter sensitivity. So if you can easily end up with this form of cycles, you have to find your hyperparameters hyper that avoid uh, these cycles. But I would say that that's no longer so much the case today. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all of these in detail because I don't have time, but if a slide has these books on them, on it, that means that there's a slide with references only for the slide at the end. So please have a look. But I would say that GANs are not so hard to train anymore in the sense of we know some good tricks. Uh, large bass sizes tend to really help, low momentum helps, but also there have been some changes which on the face of them you think, do these have to do with optimization? And the answer is yes, even batch norm. We know that the reason batch norm helps is because it makes optimization easier. ResNets help optimization. Spectral norm was originally introduced as 
making the landscape smoother, but it also seems to help optimization. And actually, this realization for me personally was what made me want to work more on optimization. I worked a lot on generative models from the distribution learning point of view, and then I kept seeing that a lot of the improvements come from understanding optimization, and I think this is actually true for supervised learning and RL as well. I think optimization is really, really important, and this is why I wanted to talk about it today. Previously, when I talked about GANs, I didn't talk that much about optimization. But I just want to give a very simple example, which is not mine, it's taken from a, a great paper of Mercedes at all, of why GAN optimization can be hard. And this is such a simple example. You only have a Dirac delta at zero as a data distribution. So you only generate zero again and again. And this is the data. And the model is also Dirac delta at theta. So the only thing that the generator, the model can do is move theta around. And we have a linear discriminator. So here this discriminator is doing reasonably well. It's putting more chance that there's real data at P star, which is good. And we also know the solution. This is really nice of this problem. It's everything has to be zero. Theta has to be zero because P star is zero. And if phi is zero, so the discriminator just is unsure between the two, this is the optimal solution. Now, one thing that they did in the, in the paper, which was really nice, is that they actually show that many GANs do not converge on this simple problem. So this made them introduce some type of regularization. We're going to make sure to mention regularizations in a bit. But it really shows that even though in this 1D discriminator and 1D generator problem, you should go towards zero, a lot of methods diverge. But this brings us to another question, which is what does convergence even mean for games? Because we know in supervised learning, you reach a local minima and that's it. But here we often talk about Nash equilibrium. So a game has reached a Nash equilibrium if no player can do better by moving to another part of the space. So that, that's it. And of course, this is a global convergence guarantee. And when we train neural networks, we won't have that. But the good news is, is that we can connect this to optimality uh, in the context of distributional learning. There should be a one over two here. Uh, I'll fix that later and resend the slides. Um, but um, again, if we don't think about neural network capacity, there is a connection between distributional learning and global Nash equilibrium. But once we start thinking about neural networks, things become a little bit more complicated. And we often want then to think about local convergence measures, such as a local Nash equilibrium. And the reason I mention some of these is that you often look at GAN papers that discuss convergence. You will often see discussion around Hessians and Hessians and their eigenvalues and the Hessians of each player has to be positive semi-definite for you to be at the local Nash equilibrium. Now, there is an interesting question that was put in a, in a very nice paper, whether do GANs reach Nash equilibrium when we train them in practice or in theory? And actually, the, papers tack the paper tackles this question twofold. First, they show that for very simple GAN problems, a Nash equilibrium might not exist. So that's not that great. But also empirically, they show that when we train GANs, they don't reach a Nash equilibrium. So this also sparks people to think about other convergence measures that maybe are reached by GANs. Um, and there's some simpler ones, such as stationarity. This is important because gradient descent will stop at the stationary point, but also looking at attractive points in a neighborhood, even though they're not uh, local Nash. So, but let's say we are concerned about Nash equilibrium or other types of convergence. The question is, how do we ensure that GANs can reach convergence? And actually, a lot of work has focused on that. And often the solution is to change the game, which is really interesting. So you don't start only with the loss in terms of the distribution learning perspective, but you also say, I want to ensure convergence, so I'm going to change the loss to add this type of regularizers. And this regularizers, there's a lot of great work done on this. Again, there's slides with references at the end. They tend to take two forms. One is the gradient norm with respect to data, and this brings us back to Lipschitz smoothness and convergence. So we, if we encourage the discriminator to be smooth, it's more likely that you will get to convergence, but also 
a lot of gradient norm regularization. And I think this is also this type of regularizers also highlight what can be difficult with GANs. You can tell the discriminator that it should not have large gradient norm or that the generator should not have large gradient norm or that both of them should not have large gradient norm. So you have a lot of choices. While in supervised learning, it's just the model. You say to the model, okay, you should have small gradient norm and that's it. Here, everything kind of tends to be exponential because every time you have to make a choice, you have a branch of factor two. And if we look at the Dirac GAN example that I showed you earlier, where there was divergence, if we use an explicit regularization method, it goes straight to the equilibrium. So sometimes we have to change the game to ensure convergence. But one question to ask is, are all of these instabilities inherent in the game, or are they sometimes due to gradient descent? And if we look at GANs from a different angle, we might try to understand that a little bit. So this is again our favorite GAN picture. We have two losses, LF and LG, and we often train this using discrete method, methods, right? Like stochastic gradient descent. But behind all of these, there's often a system of ODEs, right? There's a system in continuous time that describes the dynamics. And the way we get gradient descent actually is by discretizing these dynamics. So we know that in continuous time, if you move into the direction of the negative gradient, you're gonna to get towards the local minima but we can't go in continuous time because our computers are discrete. So we discretize with Euler discretization, we get gradient descent. Now, the question about GANs is, is there a difference in the dynamics if we use this kind of system as opposed to what we use often, which is gradient descent? And turns out that the answer is yes. So for a simple example here, it's not Dirac GAN, but something very similar, you see a situation where if I go in continuous time, there's the equilibrium, which is the red dot in the middle is reached, but gradient descent just circles around. So this is not the problem specifically with the game, but it's just the optimization that we're using is not going towards the equilibrium. Why is that? Well, every time we discretize the ODE, we have a second order error in learning rate. So that means there is a, big, a bit of a, distance between what the ODE would do and what gradient descent does. But turns out there are other types of optimizers or numerical integrators that have smaller errors, like the learning rate to the five. And if you use those, then you don't have the image to the left, but you have the image to the right. Well, that takes a while, yeah. So it's important to not only think about the game or gradient descent, but also what would happen in continuous time, because there's a difference between continuous and discrete time. And the reason I want to uh, highlight this is that if you think about, if you look at papers that talk about GAN optimization, they take one of these two views. So if you want to read some of them, it's really good to highlight in your mind which one is it. And actually, this is true for all optimization. Do they take the discrete view? Do they look at gradient descent steps, or do they look, what does the underlying ODE do? The reason sometimes we like to use the continuous view is because mathematically it tends to be easier to work in continuous time. But there are some challenges with that, which is that the original ODEs that I shown don't depend on learning rate. So there's a gap, again, between what we do in practice and what the system is doing. But even for the discrete view, sometimes it's really hard to analyze things like Adam, where you have beta one, beta two, and then the moving averages. But I think it's important to mention this because as I said, all optimization papers will take one or the other. And there's more about this, again, something that I don't have time to talk about today, but you will see some types of optimization procedures which incorporate the structure of the game. So, so far the way we incorporated the structure of this nested optimization was, was that we said, we update the discriminator a few times and then we update the generator. But actually you can do much more fun things like back propagating through the discriminator steps when you update the generator. And a lot of things that account for the fact that this is just not a simple min problem, but it's a min max problem or another type of adversarial setting. So the kind of questions to think about when it comes to GANs and optimization is, does the Nash equilibrium exist? And does our discrete optimization reach that equilibrium? And think in this setting about the difference between the continuous time and the discrete time. 
So on this part, I hope I've convinced you, even though at a very high level, that optimization is an important aspect of GAN training. There's a lot of improvements. I don't think GANs are very hard to train right now, but there's a lot of interesting theoretical questions coming along, including what is convergence? Um, in what type of time do we want to think about these problems and more? But I think there's, now we can kind of zoom out a little bit and also think about research questions between these two type of approaches. Because so far, I have presented you the first part of the talk and the second part of the talk, and I've done them in very different ways, right? There was like the distributional view, and we talked a lot about distances, divergences, and distributions, and all of these nice things. And then we talked about games, and we didn't talk about distributions at all, if you notice. There was like Nash and uh, continuous versus discrete. And this is a very a picture that looks a little bit like this. Everything is kind of like separate, very nice and neat. When you're in the distributional world, you talk about infinite capacity of the neural network, perfect optimization, and so on. But I argue that the picture is more like this. So everything is mixed and intertwined. And instead of looking at the distributional view as divergence to approximation, and then working and thinking about that, you can also think about the connection between that and the game's view, because that feeds into something that ends up being an optimization problem. And what we should be thinking about is this whole stack going from the divergence and distance to optimization, because some divergences and distances might have better optimization paths that might make it easier for us to converge. But this is actually a very hard problem, and there's very small steps taken in this direction. But I think there's a few questions that we can ask, and I'm going to leave them to you. Maybe you will ask them. Specifically, what is the connection between optimization convergence and the quality of the learned distribution? Again, when I talked about convergence to a local Nash, I didn't say anything about distributions. We don't really know for a discriminator architecture and a generator architecture, if you reach a particular local Nash, can we say something about how well the model has learned the data distribution? Similarly, there seems to be an inherent trade-off between optimization stability and distributional learning performance in GAN training. We don't really know why this is yet, but every time someone stabilizes training really well, like with an explicit regularizer, the GANs tend to not work as well. So the thing that you often do is that you train many models, and the best performing one is going to be the ones that from nine seeds, from 10 seeds, nine were not doing great, but one was doing very well, as opposed to have a situation where you really don't depend on hyperparameters and everything is stable. That seems to be true. We don't really know why and how to fix this at the moment. But I have also some positive news. Now, I, I don't want to leave you with something bleak. Oh, there's all these hard questions. Actually, I think supervised learning has an amazing progress in optimization in the last two, three years. It's a kind of like mind blowing. From starting with this knowledge that, well, local minima are less of an issue than originally thought. If you get to a local minima in supervised learning, you're probably doing really well. And then that allows us to make connection between optimization and performance. But then there's these new techniques on looking at implicit regularization, and again, looking at continuous time, and then make the connection between optimization and generalization. So supervised learning has done it, and they have done a lot of work in this area. And the question that I leave you with is, can the same be done for GANs? And again, theoretical analysis might be challenging, but we can start with some empirical studies and have a look at what's happening there. Of course, there are challenges compared to supervised learning. I didn't even get to talk about this that much. There are, again, slides at the end with references, but it's not really clear how to evaluate GANs. Because we don't have likelihoods, we have different types of metrics, that tend to correlate with what humans think of, for example, of image samples, but they also have their own challenges. So we, we don't even know necessarily how to create an automatic metric that really tells us how well we're doing. But also there's this issue of like exponential growth if you want to explain something. You, every time, unlike supervised learning, every time you choose something, you have to choose two of them. So there's a lot of challenges that come with that. So just to conclude, the reason I wanted to focus on this view of GANs is that 
even if, let's say, they're not going to be the state of the art at image generation, they do teach us some really important things about distributional divergences and how to use them in the deep learning context and also how to train implicit generative models. Your generative model doesn't need to assume a likelihood. It can, and then you can use maximum likelihood, which is great, but it doesn't need to do that. And also GANs are a useful testing ground for optimization ideas in games. We've seen only a very high level view of how you can think about GANs and games and optimization. And I think that's it, and I'm ready for a final set of questions.